For centuries, we've looked to the skies and wondered, are we alone in the universe? Could there be alien Earths that harbor or sustain life? Ray Jayawardena spends his time searching for such planets, and he joins us now to tell us more about the search for these strange new worlds. Ray, it's good to have you here at TVO. Pleasure to be here. We should say you are the Canada Research Chair in Observational Astrophysics at the U of T. Do you want to tell us what that is, first of all? Well, that means I get to uh, have fun doing what I want to do and get paid for it and, and search, you know, follow my curiosity and, and uh, find out what's out there in the universe. Well, I gather the Kepler telescope helps you with your curiosities about what's out there. So why don't you start by telling us what that is? Well, the Kepler Space Telescope is, is the culmination of, of, of a long um, search that we've uh, conducted uh, over generations, actually, looking for worlds beyond our solar system. Now, we know about the planets circling the sun, and people have speculated for millennia about similar worlds around other stars that you see in the night sky. But only in the last 20 years, that we've been able to confirm that there are indeed other solar systems. Many of them unlike ours, but we expect some of them would be uh, more similar uh, to ours. Uh, and the Kepler telescope for the first time, which was launched in March of 2009 by NASA, uh, is giving us the capability to not just find other planets, but find planets about the same size as the Earth. The Kepler telescope started in 2009, and how long is its mission, in fact? Well, it was, the mission was just extended. Initially, it was meant to be up there for three and a half years, and it's just been extended to uh, up to seven years. So that's a great, uh, great uh, promise that we might find planets even on longer periods. Do you have any doubt that it can fulfill its mission? Because well, we know from you know, the Hubble telescope, we had some ideas about how long that was going to be up there, and plans changed. I know. So most things are going quite well. Um, unlike the Hubble, though, there's no chance of repairing Kepler, because it's actually circling the sun. It's in an orbit around the sun. Uh, getting farther and farther away from the Earth as we speak, so there's no chance of sending astronauts there. To fix it if it, exactly. anything goes wrong. You mentioned that there are many other solar systems out there that you might be exploring. Got a guess at how many? Well, a great question. So 20 years ago we knew of one, and um, now we know of hundreds of others. And even before Kepler, just using telescopes on the ground, astronomers have uh, discovered planets um, in the hundreds. Now, there are about 800 known planets, what we call extrasolar planets, planets circling stars other than the sun, uh, confirmed. And in the data that's been released by Kepler so far, there are another 2,300 candidate planets. 20 so we are in, talking in the thousands now of planets other than those that circle our sun. Now, of course, our planet's made out of rock, but there are planets made out of gas and planets made out of water. And what's Kepler looking for on that front? Absolutely. So, I, I mean, I think that one of the most interesting aspects of this entire <clears throat> endeavor is the incredible diversity of worlds that we're finding. Uh, the, the, the range of their characteristics and the way they, their orbits are uh, organized around, around those stars is, is much more diverse than we could have possibly imagined. Um, as I said, Kepler is um, best at finding planets that are relatively close to their star because they, it only takes a few, some of them only take a few days to go around their suns. So it's very easy to see them coming back, you know, around every few days. Now, planets that are um, similar to the Earth in, in their orbit will take a whole year to get around their star, mm -hmm. right? So that's why Kepler needs to stay there for long enough that it can spot these planets passing in front of their suns more than once. That's how we know, first of all, how long their orbits are, how long their year is, uh, but also uh, that we can be sure that it is indeed these little dips in brightness uh, uh, in a star is caused by a planet and, and not something else. How quickly does Kepler move? Oh, it's, it's, it's basically trying to stare at one little patch of the sky. Um, about the size of my palm at arm's length. That's how big the patch of that sky that Kepler is staring at is. And it's doing that for the entire time. It's not looking anywhere else in the sky. It's staring at that one patch. And there are millions and millions of stars in that patch of the sky, out of which some 150,000 are bright enough that Kepler can measure their brightness so precisely that if a, st uh, a planet about the size of the Earth were to pass in front of those stars, one of those stars, It'll, the dip in brightness that causes, which is about one part in 10,000, Kepler can detect that. Hmm. That's how uh, we are looking for and finding these worlds. It's very difficult to take. You'd think you, know, you could point your telescope and take a beautiful picture of a planet circling another sun. And the problem is that's like trying to see a faint ember next to a bright searchlight from sure. kilometers away. 
um, you, the planet is completely overwhelmed by the brightness of the star. So we have to resort to, in most cases, we have to resort to these other tricks, um, like watching the star being tugged on by the gravity of the planet, or seeing the star dim in a periodic way when a planet happens to pass in front of it. Um, Kepler uses that second method, what we call the transit method. And that's how it's finding planets. And, and it's finding planets of a variety of sizes and a variety of orbits. As I said, the first ones to, to you know, come down the pipeline are the ones that orbit the, the stars closest. Mm -hmm. But over time, uh, Kepler will start to discover planets that are further away and further away from those same stars. Does it transmit its information instantly back to NASA control? Uh, it, we, it, the downloads happen uh, uh, regularly. Um, it's basically recording um, the brightness of each star once every half an hour. Okay. Um, any more than that, actually, you can't really um, save and download the data because the data rate is, is too low, gotcha. uh, frankly. And I guess I should ask, who's Kepler? Oh, great question. So <laughs> Kepler is named after uh, a scientist uh, who figured out the motions of planets uh, in our own solar system. We have the famous Kepler's laws that we teach in introductory astronomy. Uh, he, uh, his, 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 uh, the relationships he figured out between the uh, time it takes for a planet to circle the sun and, and how far those planets are from, uh, from the sun uh, basically led the way to Newton's laws of gravity. They actually, he didn't quite have the, the, the full insight on gravity, but, but he, his work was instrumental in, in figuring out how our own solar system worked. And he lived how long ago? Uh, it's been 400 plus years. 400 plus yeah, years, okay. Yeah. So we're, we're not going to be able to get him on the program, is what I'm saying. Uh, no, you've got okay. to settle for me, I'm afraid. <laughs> well, we're, we're happy about that. Take a look at the monitor over my shoulder here, because we're going to roll some video here. And th this is an animated clip of the Kepler field of view. And if you would, speak over it and tell us what we're looking at, OK? Let's roll this control room and see what we've got here. Fire away, Ray, right? Yeah. right up there. Oh, I see. So uh, that's the the part of the sky between the constellations of Cygnus and Lyra that, that, that Kepler is uh, staring at. Uh, it's, uh, as I said, about the size of my palm at arm's length. Hmm. And in that patch uh, that Kepler is staring at, there are 150,000 stars that are bright enough for Kepler to be able to make uh, brightness measurements with sufficient precision to detect an Earth-sized planet. Isn't that something? Absolutely. Who's involved in this mission? You mentioned NASA, but who else? Uh, it's, it's a NASA-led mission. It was actually, um, um, as I actually tell in my book, Strange New Worlds, uh, is, a, is an amazing story of this one man, Bill Baruki, who fought for 20 plus years uh, uh, with this vision to get a telescope launched into space to look for other Earths. Uh, when he started uh, on, this, on this path in the early 80s, nobody had found planets outside our solar system. So he was way ahead of his time and he got turned down many times. His proposal to build this telescope got turned down many times. Uh, but he kept going. And, and, and the discovery of planets fr with Earth-based telescopes helped convince scientists and NASA and funding agencies to, 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 to go forward with this mission. Um, so the mission involves an, a, a large team of engineers and, and scientists from uh, the world over, uh, primarily in, based in the US, but not only. Uh, and one of the other beautiful things that's happened is that just a couple of months ago, Kepler released all the data that it's taken uh, publicly. So now any scientist anywhere can um, analyze the data and, and, and look for planets, you know, try to characterize them. Um, you know, my, one, of, I, one of my own graduate students is doing this right here in Toronto. So this is happening. This is happening. People all over the world just absolutely. take the data and it's, Exactly. It's wonderful analyze. that um, because it's such a wealth of data, um, we expect the many, many interesting things to be found and many surprises to come. Um, so there's plenty of room for many different people um, to, to analyze the data in different ways, to focus on different aspects of it, not only to just mm -hmm. find planets, but actually to characterize those planet candidates that have been found, try to follow them up with ground-based telescopes. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, the objects that we are very interested in is this really oddball um, source that Kepler detected, which, which at first glance looks like it might be a Mercury-like planet, like the, the planet, in, the innermost planet in our solar system, a rocky world, a small rocky world, but that's evaporating. Somehow dust is coming off its surface, and, and, and this planet is sort of looking more like a, a comet with a big tail of dust. Hmm. Um, it sounds kind of almost too strange to be true, so one of the things you know, one of my graduate students is doing here in Toronto is we've taken uh, even better data than Kepler, in this case, with a, ground, a large ground-based telescope, an eight-meter telescope called Gemini, 
Um, but we're trying to characterize, you know, what on Earth is going on, or what on, you know, Mercury is going on in this case, um, because it looks too odd. I mean, if 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 you know dust was evaporating at the rate that that's inferred, the planet should have just, you know, used up all its dust, and there should be nothing mm. left, um, because that star is billions of years old. We don't know what's going on. So there are many interesting, you know, we, there's a huge amount of human interest and scientific interest in looking for other planets like our own, but there's also this incredible diversity of other objects out there, uh, including big planets, icy planets, rocky planets, gaseous planets, um, that, that really help us get the full picture on, on the diversity. Ray, what's the Goldilocks zone? Uh, that's where um, a planet would be at the right sort of distance from its star, that the temperatures are just right for liquid water. In other words, it's not too hot and not too cold just right that you could have liquid water on the planet's surface. The reason that this is um, such a buzzword, uh, both in science and, and, and for the public, is because the only planet we know of for sure so far that has life is the Earth. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the one thing that seems closely tied to life on Earth is, is water. So in, in, in a sense for us, because we don't know any better, in, if, uh, in some ways the search for life elsewhere has become a search for water elsewhere. Have, has Kepler been able to find any, for lack of a better expression, Goldilocks-like planets so far? It's getting very close. Uh, peop, uh, the scientists are being very careful because, as you can imagine, it, it, it's a tremendous discovery and, and there's a lot of interest in it. Um, and, and we don't want to get fooled, so scientists are being quite careful about how they uh, go about trying to verify their initial discoveries, especially when it comes to uh, an Earth size in the Goldilocks zone. Uh, but there are certainly candidates that are being followed up. Um, Do they have names? Uh, unfortunately, we haven't gotten that far. Okay. Um, astronomers, you know, despite all the, all the, the romantic history that we have, uh, have been slow to decide that we want to name planets beyond our solar system. So they right now have boring catalog numbers. Uh, beyond uh, just catalog numbers. So exactly. Ray's planet does not yet exist. No, okay. I'm afraid not. Beyond water, which you're about to take a swig of, what would constitute uh, scientific evidence of life on another planet? That's a tough one, um, because as I said, we have one example to go on, mm -hmm. and, and if we've learned anything in, uh, from the history of science, it's, it's dangerous to generalize too much from, from one example. Mm -hmm. uh, but based on what we know so far, uh, in addition to water, we're looking for a planet who's um, you know, with the right sort of temperature, but also has an atmosphere that presumably consists of um, other molecules that we associate with life. Uh, molecules like oxygen, methane, ozone. Uh, these are the kinds of uh, molecules that we call biosignatures. So the challenge is basically, you know, these planets are tens or hundreds of light years away, and we're trying to detect life on them. And we can't even see the planet directly, right? Mm. So we really have to resort to clever tricks to get at that, and that's challenging. However, um, we are at a point, at least for somewhat bigger planets, we can tell something about what their atmospheres are made of. Uh, and that really allows us to narrow down possibilities. Now, to really be able to be confident of, of having you know, multiple biosignatures detected securely on a planet about the size of the Earth, um, it might take the next generation of telescopes because it's a very tough problem. It's a big leap from where we are to, to actually having that confirmation. Uh, the good news is that in addition to Kepler, the, the planet searches, you know, Kepler is targeting this one particular field of stars, but the ground-based telescopes targeting the nearest stars to the solar system one by one looking for habitable planets. And just a couple of months ago, uh, a, a planet uh, not in the habitable zone, too hot, but not much more massive than the Earth was discovered around the nearest star system. How far away? Just four light years away. Just four light years. Just four years. light years away. That's our, you know, that's our <laughs> nearest neighbor, right? Hmm. What, what's significant about that is that particular planet is too hot to harbor life, but it's about the same mass as the Earth. And if there's one planet in that system, chances are there could be others. And maybe one of those others could be in the habitable zone. As we say on Star Trek, is it an M-class planet? We don't, not that one, that particular one. <laughs> Who knows what else could... You there, know what I mean, could, right? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Hydrogen, could nitrogen, have, atmosphere. Yeah, okay. but there could be others. But the other point about it is that to have such a planet in the nearest star system, that must mean most stars have planets like it. Hmm. Right? I mean, what are the chances otherwise that randomly just the, the nearest neighbor happens to have a planet about the mass of the Earth? 
It must be because those planets are common. And just this week, there was yet another announcement of uh, actually slightly bigger planets than, more massive planets than the Earth around another neighboring star called Tau Ceti. And that's only about 12 light years, I think. What would discovering other worlds teach us about our own? Fantastic question. Again, I go back to the point about the danger of generalizing from one, from one example. Now, we, we have a much better sense of our own world than we do of any of these other planets. But um, even just comparing the Earth to Venus and Mars in our solar system, we can learn a lot. Now, even on the Earth, even today, we need a little bit of a greenhouse effect for it to be warm enough for life as we know it. Mm -hmm. Not too much. Not too much. And the example we have of too much is Venus right next door, where um, the uh, extra amount of carbon dioxide from volcanoes on Venus that's trapped in its atmosphere has really led to a, a runaway greenhouse where the temperatures have been raised by an extra 500 degrees Celsius. So it's, you know, hell on Venus. <laughs> and Mars is on the other side, a little bit further away from the sun and a little too cold uh, for life as we know it. And it's a little too small to have a substantial atmosphere, so it doesn't actually have much of a greenhouse uh, effect at all. And it might have had some periods of greenhouse warming in the past because we see some evidence of, uh, of you know, water flowing on Mars in the past. Um, these you know, channels of, uh, uh, you know, carved out in, in, in the landscape. But you know, Mars didn't, isn't, doesn't seem too habitable right now except perhaps for some, some primitive organisms. Mm. Now, when we have other worlds, other rocky worlds like the Earth, like um, Venus, like Mars, and many others, beyond our solar system, we'll have multiple examples to, to compare to and to understand the different pathways that a rocky planet could evolve. And that would really give us the context for understanding uh, whether, you know, how special the Earth is or not uh, and, and, and what about it made life possible uh, by, by finding planets that are habitable elsewhere and, and some that might not be and that they would still teach us. Uh, what went wrong in terms of being able to, uh, to support life. Fascinating. Ray, I wish you well in finding Earth's twin. Thank I you so much. I hope it's you. And for more information, read Ray's new book, Strange New Worlds, The Search for Alien Planets and Life Beyond Our Solar System. Great to have you here at TVO. Thanks so much. Thank you, Steve. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.